I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. What are we looking at today, Rob? I was about to start out by saying Happy New Year. You just jumped right to business. I don't care. You don't I'm, care? It's I'm, tough starting the new year I'm, on a bad I'm, foot I'm like a this. I'm a businessman, just like, uh, well, I'm not going to say. Please don't say <laughs> it. That would be great. <laughs> Actually, we we caught up before the podcast. There's not much left to share that wouldn't be redundant. No. So, it's one thing we are not is redundant. redundant. We Sometimes never do. We are redundant, but we are never. And we redundant. never do anything over again, right, Lee? That's true. We never repeat things. That's true. Except for the multiple podcasts we've had to do four times because of recording problems. That's true. And that's not our fault. That's, that's technology. True. That's true. That's true. This is you just need to get used to saying that for everything I say, and everything will be much smoother. You're worse than my wife. Well, a lot of things could be said about that, but <laughs> but not in the space of the podcast. That's, We're all business here. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So you are about to say, what are we looking at today, right? What are we looking at today, Thank Rob? you. We're talking about something you and I have wanted to talk about for a long time. I, I want to narrate this moment when Lee and I discovered this was even a thing. Because even if you study Chinese literature, there's always stuff that falls through the cracks. There's tons you know? of pockets. I mean, yeah. they have 5,000 years of... Ish. 5,000-ish, give or take three or 4,000 years of literary history. It's hard to... It's, it's easy to miss little bits and yeah. pieces. And so we were in a seminar once... And I forget even what we were talking about. It doesn't matter. But the professor at the time, in an offhand comment, said something to the effect of, yeah, that reminds me a little bit about the Lao Shu novel Cat Planet, dot, dot, dot. And he continued, and all four of us, in the se- five of us, I guess, in the seminar went, stop, 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 wait, 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 wait. What, what did you say? There's a satire that paints China as a bunch of cats. On, on the Mars, planet, on the planet Mars, on the planet Mars, written in the 1930s. Yes, that it just skewers Chinese government, everything. politics, culture, yeah, history, everything. So, and we found out about this book from the professor, and all of us immediately had to go out and try to find what? copies of it. It's crazy. And, and why did we want to talk about it? Well, I mean, someone wrote a satire. With cats on Mars, how do you not at least want to find out what what that is? You know, how has this not been made a movie? I I, I may have been. Mm, I, I don't, don't know. Think so. I, I do know. I do know. This this provided a great teaching moment in a course I taught over the summer on you science fiction. This novel. I taught this novel in a class on science fiction in China, and uh, we looked at various covers over the years. And this is a great inroad to just how weird Japanese popular culture can be, because one of the editions put out in Japan, the cover is deeply disturbing. Mm. Like in in the book, the, we, the Lao Shu, the author, talks about cat people, and in the earliest versions of the book, like the cover was just cats wearing clothes. The Japanese cover is this weird, like hybrid cat person with very disturbing teeth. It was it was very weird. Anyway, excellent. I know, but so the, the book. Um, as, as Lee mentioned, one of the things that's fantastic about it is is it just it just destroys everything. It completely skewers everything, anything in Chinese society in the 1930s. We're we're talking about. We should give a little context. Yes, this book is written by Lao Shu, who is uh, one of the more famous literary figures. I'd say he's kind of a middling literary figure. I'd of the put him in the century. top five in terms of the impact on modern Chinese writing. Okay. I can yeah. go with I can go with like four or five uh in terms of kind of mainland fiction. Mm-hmm. He is born eighteen ninety nine. Thank you. Born. Mm-hmm. His father Northern China. His father was killed by the barbaric hordes of the eight nation army that was made up of England, France, Japan, and a couple of others who were invading Beijing at the time uh, and and burning down and opposing uh, the boxers eventually yeah, mm-hmm. opposing the boxers and burning down uh, some some palaces and things that that the Chinese are still rightfully so I would say quite bitter about mm-hmm. so he has he comes out of this weird space he was fairly poor but from a manchurian family Mm -hmm. and lao shu so we're talking about the end of the qing dynasty manchurians are ruling they're the ruling dynasty Mm -hmm. but he so he comes from a privileged place but a fairly unprivileged part of that privileged place i would say Mm -hmm. he's very famous for writing a play called chaguar which just means tea house Mm -hmm. and it it's one of the most famous representations of the Beijing dialect in 
in writing. In writing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it it's excellent. I've actually acted it out a little bit in in small portions. Very we need badly. to put that vo- audio on the podcast. And there somewhere. is there is video of it in Qingdao. We uh, Qing, gotta Qingdao find a link. This has got to go on the podcast station. site. I don't I don't know if I'm featured in any of that because I was ugly. Um, <laughs> you, as as was mentioned in a previous uh, space, Lee and I have faces for podcasts. So Chaguar is. A fantastic representation of the Beijing dialect, and that's probably what he's most famous for. And the other, the other thing that the Lao is known for is the novel. It's it's variously translated rickshaw or camel xiangzi, uh, which is about a rickshaw puller. It's phenomenally dark and depressing. It's incredibly socially informed, right? Socially informed, but what's interesting about it is the way the character morphs from being basically just a worker who has no investment whatsoever in any part of society except just pulling his rickshaw to someone who very unwittingly gets caught up in a lot of the different schemes embroiling where he is, and then he eventually dies, I think, of a sexually transmitted disease at the end of the book. All of Lao Shih's works, literary works, are socially informed. Rickshaws, definitely. Chaguar, I think, is concerned about, like, the Beijing dialect and in a linguistic way. Mm-hmm. So Lao Shu's cat country is also incredibly socially informed, but it's a satire. It's unlike rickshaw, which is just dark. This is hilarious and dark, right? It's, it is. It's hilarious in that very Swiftian way where it's, it's both funny and not funny mm-hmm. at the same time. You um, mentioned Swift. I should point out, Lao Shu worked at SOAS, the School for Oriental and African Studies, in or London. an earlier mm-hmm. version of it in London. And so he was familiar. He loved Dickens, and I believe he was familiar with Swift. And it does appear like Cat Country is kind of... It's very similar. It, it's it, taking, it, it reads almost like Gulliver's Travels yeah. in the sense that it's very picaresque. Uh, the, the shell of the story is this Chinese astronaut... Well, three Chinese astronauts crash land on Mars. Only one of them survives, and he's picked up and rescued by a cat person. And therein begins this sort of exploration of cat person society. It's not a particularly linear story. It's just he just goes from thing to thing observing, almost Mm -hmm. like an anthropologist. Again, Gulliver's Travel. Yes. And in a bit of of, uh, of a spoiler alert, cat country implodes at the end, and he's rescued. The protagonist is rescued by French astronauts. Anyway, so that's the gist of it. Yeah, there, there's not really anything to say about what happens. I mean, are there are there any kind of in events that you think? The, not the really. The, needs the majority to know? of what's interesting in the novel is the different things that get attacked, and I'll give you a quick catalog of those Please. things. Right? He attacks the language. Cat language is apparently too simplistic, <laughs> and anyone can write a poem in cat language by knowing only ten of the cat words and just mm. piling them up. He attacks the music, which is just banging and shouting and clanging for no reason, which if you've heard Peking opera is only kind of untrue. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very dangerous territory. I, know, I, I love Peking opera, but I'm aware of how it sounds. Anyway, mm. he attacks the architecture as having huge walls for no reason and no one can get in or out. So it's this, this weird thing. Mm. He attacks the, the drug use in cat that's Society? a huge part of yes, this is. novel, the revelry leaves. They, they eat leaves off of these trees. The leaves are called reverie leaves. Reverie is in like a dreamlike state. And they're all addicted to them. And most of the currency is actually based on these leaves that you just you know trade around. And what's interesting is no one seems to work. There are very few people who seem to the work. The education system is a joke in cat country. According to the one of uh, the the astronaut characters guides through cat country society. All you really have to do to get a, a degree in cat country is show up for the first day of class and they just give you your degree and you go home. That's how you learn. Let's mention that, that guide scorpion. Well, there's two scorpion starts off. He's a landowner. His, his name is translated scorpion. He's the one who rescues the, the, the astronaut figure, the protagonist yeah. from the, the crash. Right. But the or, most, the more interesting one though, really is Scorpion's son. Mm. There are one or two other figures. Uh, Hawk is one of them, who's mm. kind of an old figure who comes down from the mountains. And as the novel goes on, you realize that actually Cat Country is just one of the civilizations on the planet. Mm. And it's by far the best. It's been pushed around by all the other civilizations for many, many years. And mm. they're kind of a joke to all the other civilizations, but think they're the best. Yeah. 
I should point out that Lao Shi writes this in 1932. What's happening in 1932? Well, in a couple of things. First, personally, Lao Shi returns from England, where he's been a lecturer at the School for Oriental and African Studies. He comes back to teach in Singapore in 1929, and then eventually gets back to the mainland to teach, so early 1930s. Now, what happens the year before, he writes, Cat Country is the so-called Mukden Incident, in which the Japanese military stages kind of a fake attack on a railway in Manchuria Mm. as a pretext for bringing its military in and occupying the region, Mm. which is the beginning of what would eventually be the next full invasion of China. So Lao Shi comes back from a place where he kind of falls in love with Western arts and letters, gets back to his own country, a little bit like Lu Xun's experience in Tokyo Mm. about 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier almost, gets back to China, looks around and goes, why are we still getting pushed around Mm. by the Japanese? Why have we still made no progress with regards to the, any of the other countries that are in our country, like what is wrong with us? This is the sort of mindset that you see all through cat country. One of the things that echoes throughout this novel that I, I thought was interesting, the protagonist is Chinese. Yes. So he is talking about the glories of China mm-hmm. and how great it is and how different it is from cat country and even how, though yeah even though it, it's clearly meant mm-hmm. that the whole novel is clearly meant to skewer china yeah in the 1930s do you feel like lao Shi identifies with the i mean you said he's talking about china almost as if he feels like he's chinese right but lao Shi is in a very complicated position right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he is ethnically manchurian and the Manchurians have ruled China, but they are not of the majoritarian Han Chinese. Right. China sort of has a government at that point, but it sort of doesn't. I mean, it's kind of negotiating. The, the Republic of China is ruling. Chiang Kai-shek is in charge. Mm-hmm. But it's largely ruled by warlords who are local potentates. And, and there isn't... And he's coming from England and then Singapore. And it feels like... In some ways, he's searching for an identity and, right. and, and how critical he is about China's failures in terms of cat country's failures. Yeah. I, I wasn't entirely sure – I wasn't sure what to make of his mm. identity there. I think that's a great point, and it's one of the reasons why this is not just a sort of dime store novel attack on culture. Is that the, the way that Lao Shi sets this up is deceptively complex because – You do have a Chinese figure attacking Martian, quote-unquote, society that is a clear representation of 1930s China. So you have a Chinese person attacking China, right? Mm -hmm. But this Chinese person is coming from a a very different place. He's coming from a China that's rich enough and well-off enough to send astronauts to Mars. And, And he's quite proud of the fact that he is the first Chinese person to set foot on Mars. Yes, yes. I, th- I think you're right to see some some parallels there. I think Lao Shi probably saw himself as a kind of a stranger in a strange land. Mm. Uh, again, not unlike Lu Xun, who in Tokyo... Do you always have to make it about Lu Xun? Just about everything goes there. I mean, you can't Whatever. avoid it, you know? You know, actually, this is this is a nice segue because Lee's, Lee's looking at, at me with borderline contempt for my <laughs> continual use of Lu Xun. <laughs> but one of the things that I've, I remember Lee actually saying on this podcast a few times about the May 4th movement is that most people in the May 4th movement are either socialists or very sympathetic to socialism. Yes. Can I go ahead and say you're on the record as saying that somewhere? I I think definitely the May 4th has a a sort of socialist bent to it. Okay, so this is where – and it is true. If you just start off reading the kind of the official literary histories put out by the Chinese government – or I shouldn't say by the Chinese government, put out by a lot of universities in China. No, no, no. I think think you're you're on to something. Okay. The version of the May 4th that we get is – "Quote unquote," sanitized through Communist Party lens, mm-hmm. and that lens tends to go tends to promote more socialist. Right. That the great writers of, are those yeah. who eventually would be sympathetic to yeah. socialism. Now, Lao Shi is a huge exception. This is not to say that Lao Shi thinks that all things 
pertaining to Marxism and socialism in general are bad, but in fact, rickshaw is quite well. I, 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 I want to point this out. I know what you're saying, but actually, the end there were there, there were two ends to that novel. The hmm. first one is just the way he wrote it, and the book ends with him dying hmm. of an STD. Hmm. That was the original version, but eventually he tacked on when he saw the way the winds were blowing. And an ending wherein he still does die of an STD, but only after sort of side learning to side with a political movement, which basically is socialism in the book. Hmm. So there's sort of two like – it's a little bit like a lot of, of Zhang Ailing's novels where sure. there's an original version and there's kind of an altered version yeah. for later. But this novel, Cat Country. Cat Country is amazing in the sense that there's a section – of when cat country is imploding in the second, about the last quarter of the book, the protagonist is wandering through checking things out and comes across various protesters. And I think this may have been the most hilarious of I the would agree. rings. I would agree. And I'm not going to read all of it. I'm only going to read bits and pieces. Please. But he comes across a group of protesters and they're standing around a stone. And on the stone is written the following <laughs> Spirit indwelling. Sorry, spirit dwelling of the great immortal Uncle Carl, Carl with a K. <laughs> so, I mean, we're in, he's not even being subtle about it. And here's what Lao Sho writes. One of those in the front row got up, stood upon the inscribed stone, and addressed the group. Long live Uncle Carl's skiism. Long live everybody <laughs> shares skiism. Long live Pinksy, Panksy, Postpost. They all echoed his cries. After they had stopped shouting, the one who had stood up addressed them as they sat on the ground. We must overthrow the great spirit and concentrate all of our faith in Uncle Carl the Great. We must overthrow our fathers and teachers. And to hasten the recovery of our freedom, we must overthrow the emperor and put everybody Shersky-ism into practice. We welcome the foreigners who invade us today, for they, Pinksy Panksy, Post posts. And I'm going to stop there because what happens again and again in this little paragraph is in the English translation, there's this – it's just this gibberish, right? It's completely gibberish, yeah. And it's just, this is all the official terms. And I find that such a hilarious send-up of Marxists operating in China wherein the protagonist is basically saying they're all shouting the same slogans, but no one really knows what they mean. And what's funny is he skewers – Lausha skewers – these Marxists as semi-religious in that they're yes. worshiping the Uncle spirit, Carl, yeah. the spirit of Uncle Carl. It's 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 hilarious because of of how how ridiculous he makes these figures seem, but also how accurate it was at the time. I would say right. there's there there's obviously some subtlety in the way Marxism is interpreted in China. Mm. I think of Li Dajiao. Uh, who writes some really interesting stuff about socialism. Uh, but clearly, the popular version of this, according to Lao Xia, I always want to put this in the play, this is what Lao Xia is seeing, uh-huh. uh, is full of people who are ready to overthrow the old without really knowing what it is they're putting into place. I just want to point out, so the Chinese for this everybody skiism? Share yeah, skiism. Shareism mm-hmm. is 大家扶自己. So that fu ji is a Russian tag. It's a linguistic tag in Chinese that just makes something Russian-y. Yeah. Russian-ish. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the right word. fu ji yeah. So, yeah, it's like everybody-ism-ski. Yeah, is Essentially, exactly. that would probably be a more accurate translation. So there's no he, – there are no – he's not making any bones about this. This is clear what he's going for. And eventually, these Marxists, they have their own little civil war, right? Well, yeah, it's funny. It's only one page. They're only in the book for like two pages – Fully. They, mm-hmm. Eventually, they pop up later when everybody's fleeing the city for no apparent reason. And this but is, let me let me just jump in here real quick because on, in that page, they go from doing all the same slogans and shouting and raising their hands stuff. to the following exchange. This is what is written. Since we are not agreed on a united course of action, let's split up and go our own ways. Let the kill the emperor faction go and kill the emperor. And the kill our fathers faction go home and kill their fathers, said still another. <laughs> But Uncle Carl the Great only took up the kill the emperor, Pogsomuski. He didn't say anything about killing our fathers. Counter-revolutionary, let's kill that misinterpreter of the sacred words of Uncle Carl the Great. So 
that's how they basically start attacking each other. Mm. And in this space of a page and a half, they go from religious revelry to, to civil war to then back to religious revelry. Summoning every bit of strength they had left, Lausha writes, they all faced the stone and cried, Long live Uncle Carl! And then they all departed, each going his own separate way. And this is the final sentence. What kind of circus was this? <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I find it so interesting is that this is not an attack on socialist policies. This is not an attack on the history of the movement. This is an attack on the rhetoric. And it's a very trenchant critique because what Laos is criticizing is not the idea that having everything in common or having uh, you know property not be privately held is a bad idea. What he's what he's got a problem with is no one knows what they're talking about. Like everyone's just shouting and yelling and eventually fragmenting over nothing because they don't even know what they're reading. Yeah, there's not at all any sense of a kind of ideological criticism. There's no ideology to this. It's all about the kind of politics of politics and, that the kind of yeah and this is one of the things that irritated Lu Xun not just about socialism but about a lot of the revolutionary movements I know I always come back to Lu Xun Elias is smiling again but I bring up Lu Xun because it's a familiar touchstone um, <laughs> is that what people wanted was to overthrow stuff now what to do afterwards no one knew that was according to you know Lu Xun and I think Lao Xia is seeing something similar which is Everybody wants to get something done. They want to overthrow a thing, but they don't really know what it is they're overthrowing, mm. and they don't know what to replace it with. They just want to go kill somebody. Let's mm. kill the emperor, kill the father, I don't know. And then they eventually do nothing because no one really has any idea what they're doing. Interestingly, Lao Shi talking about this circus, he was eventually – do you know how he died? Yes. He was eventually killed by that circus. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily killed by it. What happened was that he was persecuted by Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution and was beaten, forced into a sort of a struggle session. Yeah. And he was so humiliated and psychologically damaged by the event that he drowned himself in Taiping Lake in uh, Beijing, Peking University. I would still argue that him drowning himself after being struggled against by some figures who probably are spouting a kind of Share skiism. <laughs> Share skiism. Not too different from cat country. Right. It's a I, – I really wonder, did Lausha, when he was drowning himself, was he thinking, man, I was really right in 1932? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know how writers think when they kill themselves. You've got to go back to this moment, and, and, and we've, we, we shouldn't oversell this one particular moment. You, you made the point it's only a page in the right. novel. He's skewering warlords. He's skewering – uh, drug sale and drug sellers in China. He's skewering all kinds of people throughout this novel. This is just one good example, and I think it's an interesting example just mm -hmm. because of the way he dies. It points out the potential power that satirists really have. Mm -hmm. He, Lao Xia, actually was able to see th the future and to see something, even though he didn't know it was the future. I think if he knew it was the future, he would have spent a lot more time writing about it and, yeah, I and, think so too. and picking it apart. But he does see the, the kind of end of 1930s communism, which is the Cultural Revolution, which eventually killed him. He, he took his own life, but he was so, so under such pressure that I, I don't think it's really even fair to suggest that he took his own life. He was, he was murdered by communism. And I think it's just fascinating to have that kind of biographical detail mm -hmm. connected to this one passage. I agree. And I also think the other biographical detail that runs all through this is his extensive experience outside of China. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that troubled him immensely, especially when he got back to China, was what exactly to do. The, the question of keeping the foreigners, quote unquote, the non-Chinese out – was was hadn't been a question for over a century. So they're there to stay. Their stuff is there to stay. But one of the, the things that runs all through the, the novel of Cat Country and many different examples is cat people just taking in foreign, non-cat country stuff without having any idea what it is or what it does. They just use it. There's this uncritical either reception or rejection of that which is not from cat country in the novel. Hmm. And I see that as one of the things that deeply troubled Lao Xia because – he he understood that he was at least privileged enough to have worked overseas and traveled and seen things. He can't expect that for everybody, especially not the common laborer like he would have put 
like he would have did put in the novel Rickshaw, someone like this can't go teach yeah. in London, you know, but what do we do then? Like, how, how do you interact with things that are not from your country if you're not privileged enough to leave your country and actually understand them? And so that's all through the novel as well. Eventually, the answer is simply that you don't. You implode. He doesn't really provide an answer. He, he mean, doesn't. He just he just predicts the future, which is that whole section, at least in the Chinese version that I read, is called si guo, so like death of the country. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, one, the translation in English is everything is beginning to collapse. The, the translation I should mention is by William Lyell. It's the only translation I think that exists. It's Penguin so, Books. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a great translation. It actually, it, it does it does justice to the original. And I, sh- I should point out in, in 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 I guess homage or something to the translator that Lao Shu is really hard to translate because he works with so much dialect, and so this everybody share skiism, for example, that's so hard. I How do you I'm translate like, yeah. that? You know, and no, I think he did, he did a good job translating the it, way he did. So it's fantastic. I think yeah. we should end there. So if you're interested. Mao Cheng Ji is the name of the Chinese. It's by Lao Shi. The English translation is just Cat, Cat Country. Country. Put out by Penguin Books, translated by William Lyell. It's not a page turner necessarily. It goes from sort of anthropological observation to anthropological observation. It's one of those things that you might want to read a chapter here, a chapter there, but yeah. you don't. You're you're not going to be going cover to cover in a day. Yeah, no, it's not going to work like that way. But it is interesting. It's brutal, and it's really a really inter- well, it's an interesting window onto. The 1930s in China, because so many people, not just Lao Shu, but so many people had had it, right? Because by then, you've had the overthrow of the Qing dynasty. You've had, quote unquote, Republican government, military dictatorship. You've had basically a reshuffling of political power for decades. The upheaval of various cultural powers by the May 4th movement in 1919 that that's been going on for well over 15 years, mm-hmm. and now we're at the same place we were before. Yeah. For someone like Lao Shu, that's just what, – what do we do? Like do we just detonate everything? Like I, I don't even know what to do anymore. So it's, it's brutal and it's kind of sad, but it's also a very interesting window onto that era. I think that's a great place to end this podcast. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.